Hi, everybody, and, uh, and uh, uh, good afternoon. First of all, thank you very much to, um, to all of you for joining us in this, uh, for this session. Um, I've kind of been reflecting on where should we take this panel and what should we be looking at. And uh, I, you know, the first time that the uh, Singapore FinTech Festival came together in, was it 2016, there was a lot of conversation around uh, DLT and around blockchain. And I think the intent of this panel is to really flush out how have we progressed and where are we going with that. And I must admit, hats off to the, to the organizers who've pulled together a, a phenomenal panel. Um, you can please take a look in your, um, your the, the apps, which I think is the app, which is great. We have an awesome panel behind us. I'm not going to, just because time is short, introduce all of them. But if you look, read their bios, there is an absolute wealth of um, knowledge and talent uh, joining me on the stage today. And what's interesting is we've got the perspective of both pra practitioners and from regulators. So you really should get a very rich understanding of how this technology has been evolving and, and, um, and, and where you can use it. And I think that's really the context of this panel. What we're going to look at is, is this hype or is this reality? Then we're going to sort of understand, well, what actually, when you say there's reality, what are the sort of applications? What are the barriers to the adoption of that, uh, of, of that uh, technology? to benefit you. And then a really interesting point, I think, which is, should you start now or should, should you wait? Should you be a fast follower, a slow follower, or should you get engaged now? And then we'll do a reflection on where do we think this is all going to take us. Um, so with that, uh, in no particular order, um, David, um, welcome to the panel. It's great to have you uh, up on stage. Um, hype or reality? Um, I, I'm actually a little bit uh, surprised that we're still talking about that with everything going on, Chris. So uh, there's been a tremendous amount of hype. We all know that. A lot of the hype was around the ICO craze and the get-rich-quick uh, craze. But a few companies like ours have been focusing on trying to solve real business problems with, uh, you know, with proven technology. So I think that uh, there's no doubt we're way beyond the hype cycle. And just you know, speaking from R3's perspective, uh, and I checked some of the numbers this morning, and you know, we now have 172 global partners providing, uh, building on, and providing services around Corda. And you know, some of the names you probably heard of, like Microsoft and HPE and Accenture and Tata and Cognizant and all the uh, big firms, but also you know, mid-level uh, and, and good-sized software firms, startups, and the like. So the community is building. I think that's proof in and of itself. And uh, you know, there's over 150 applications that we know of that are being built with 20 or so live. And you can get a feel for that by going to R3 Marketplace. So, so while I admit that's a bit of a pitch about what's going on R3, I can only talk about what's going on here. And it certainly isn't hype. These are applications that are solving real world problems in business and are live now. So uh, I think it's time to stop talking about hype and so really focusing on solving So you problems. think reality is here and real problems are getting solved? 100%. Mark, would you agree? Well, going back a couple of years, just to start up, who is ASIC? I'm representing the Australian Securities Investments Commission. We're the financial market conduct regulator in Australia. So we are one of the regulators who looks after financial market infrastructure, including clearing and settlement. So in my role as the coordinating innovation hub, we got lots of people coming in the previous year saying, I want to talk to you about DLT. I see it as the solution to everything. Can we chat about that? There's certainly a lot less of that now. Uh, but the other important thing, obviously, in Australia is that we have a case study where uh, a form of configuration of DLT is going into production, and that is in relation to the replacement of some part of our clearing and settlement system in Australia with the Australian Securities Exchange. So there is clearly an example that it is becoming a reality. Uh, other parts of the Australian marketplace are looking at examples, but that's probably the stellar example I point to. Thank you, Mark. You're good. So Swiss, they've also not been sitting on their hands. They've been getting engaged. What's been going on in Switzerland in terms of hype versus reality? Well, indeed, I, I agree with what has been said at the beginning. It was probably a hype in the sense that uh, you need to market it a little bit in order to attract the attention of investors. So, But by now, I would like to say that um, that's certainly not a hype anymore. We have Maybe I can mention three observations. The first is that we realized that very powerful investors are getting into the market in order to, and that, that already happened quite some time ago. So some powerful investors start to engage in a new te technology. That's the, fir that's the first point. The second point is uh, we are more and more approached by uh, market participants uh, with regard to our regulatory framework. They would like us to adapt our regulatory framework in order to, 
to be conducive to the new technology. And this is something that is increasing, these requests, these questions that we need to answer. So another sign that there is really a great potential behind. And the thir third observation maybe is with regard to just what Mark said. Uh, our, our Swiss stock exchange is about to enter into the market with a, with a fully integrated end-to-end -end trading settlement and, and a custody service for digital services. So this is also an, a, a signal or an indication for us that incumbents and even our market infrastructure is about to engage in that and, and they certainly wouldn't do it if there is not a high potential behind it. Jason, what do you think? Okay, thank you. Okay, so first of all, my name is Jason Jones. I'm an entrepreneur in residence at uh, at Consensus, we have about 1,300 employees globally. Uh, the three main businesses, the three big businesses that we're in are, number one, we are a venture incubation studio. So we incubate a lot of companies. We have over 50 companies that we've incubated so far. Uh, number two, we have a solutions group, which is a large solutions group that works with large banks and insurance companies and others. And number three, we have a capital, capital group, which is building in the capital markets. I run the, uh, the newly formed uh, asset management group at Consensus, and uh, so that's why I'm on this panel. Um, as, in f as far as hype is concerned, um, I think experimentation is a good thing, and I think there's a lot of innovative entrepreneurs out there that are starting very small and are trying things, trying things out. So do you call that hype? Uh, there's lots of different businesses that are trying to be created. Lots of them are going to fail. Most of them are going to fail. And we're in this cycle of innovation and experimentation. That's a good thing as far as I'm concerned. But on the other side of that is we're really seeing real businesses start to emerge. Things that are going to grow tremendously. And I think that's one of the things that Chris and I talked about earlier was that we're getting through that cycle and we're actually seeing companies emerge that are going to be real companies. And that's an exciting um, next phase for our industry. So uh, my summary of what you've been hearing is that, yeah, there's a load of hype, but there's also a, a stack of reality going on. So let's talk about some of that reality in a little bit more detail. David, you, you mentioned a couple of examples, but where, what do you think is the killer use case for DLT for blockchain? Um, I, you know, there's, there's so much going on, Chris. I'm not uh, in a unique position to, uh, you know, to, to, to pull one out of the hat. We have a lot. Um, you just mentioned insurance. We've got a tremendous amount going on in insurance, and uh, that wasn't our initial focus. And I'm often asked why. And to me, it's kind of like why cell phones took off in Africa. The insurance industry hasn't spent as much as the banking community in trying to modernize their system, so it's a little bit of easier uh, transition. I think some really difficult problems like um, KYC, corporate KYC and all, could finally be solved by this. Uh, but, you know, there's just so many exciting use cases, not just... Uh, in the institutional and business world, but uh, you know how people live today and how how welfare payments are made, how the technology can can be used to solve issues with the unbanked uh, and the like. So I'm not going to uh, pick one. Since this is a capital markets uh, panel, I will make an observation. I know we're, you know we'll probably touch on this later, but uh, there was a tremendous amount of early momentum in capital markets. It kind of slowed a little bit, and now it's coming back in a big wave. So we'll see what uh, what comes out of that. Jason, you, you're looking at, across the piece at a lot of things. You mentioned asset management. Where do you see that opportunity? All right, so um, I started my career uh, in Web 1.0 as a research analyst on the sell side. And uh, the hottest space back then was internet infrastructure. The Akamai's and Inktomies of the world and the Exoduses of the world that were doing hosting. Um, and that's kind of where we are now. We're, we're building the infrastructure layer of the blockchain, which is really important. It was really getting all the, all the attention. And we're doing that also in the capital market space. Every component of capital markets is being reinvented right now on the blockchain. Uh, and that's super interesting. But I think we're going to get through that and we're going to see uh, real businesses come out of that. So uh, in the asset management space, for instance, we're shifting from purely digital assets to tokenization of real assets. Uh, there's a ton of different categories that we are particularly interested in. Real estate, credit slash securitization, um, supply chain finance. These, these are categories that are tokenizing right now. And as they do, I think you're going to see in the next three years, that's going to be like the big deep categories where we can deploy a ton of money. From a sort of market oversight and regulatory perspective in Switzerland or in, in Australia, what do you see as the benefit to regulators and or the market participants 
end customer, the end investor. Is this, is this good news for, for, for them or is this so what? Well, <clears throat> I think it's good news for them. It depends a little bit on the regulator. We are usually we try to be very open to new technologies. We have to be because this is the only asset that we have to remain innovative and to really embrace new technologies. And, and I think from that point of view, this, the, the atmosphere of experimenting is also having the possibility to fail at the end of the day if a, if, if a market uh, or if a model doesn't work. Uh, it simply belongs to, to the whole development and, and we try to be open to that and, and I believe that as, as had already has been said um, I think what is important for the financial market from our perspective and that's what we get most out of it is the fact that it be becomes more and more efficient and these efficiency gains are certainly something that this is very interesting to see. We also work on a tokenization of shares, as you mentioned it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue that we try to tackle with our regulation in order to enable this, this, uh, this new, this new uh, branch or this, this new trend that we observe. So from that point of view, if you, if we, if you believe that uh, the regulator is, is, is rather a partner and not an opponent who tries to support the new development, I think it's good news. It's also good news for us because that opens up new possibilities and makes the, makes the market, market even, bi even bigger for, for the Swiss financial market. There are a number of uh, jurisdictions, and I would put Singapore down, Australia, uh, the Brits, uh, the Canadians, who have really driven quite hard in terms of adopting or looking to make the adoption of this technology easy. Zug has become a, you know, a real hotbed of technology. What do you see as the regulatory changes, if any, that need to happen to enable the adoption of this technology? Well, just to carry on to your previous question, when thinking about markets and infrastructure, we concentrate on fair, orderly, transparent markets. There are plenty of principles out there from uh, international organisations, the Bank for International Settlements, as well as IOSCO, uh, which have all laid out principles around controls of markets and operations of, of market infrastructure. And I think the, the DLT offers the possibility of meeting some of those principles, perhaps in more efficient ways, with value-added propositions to them, in terms of smart contracts, a different kind of product services, um, uh, delivery versus payment at a real-time level, where that may not be the case. They're all potentials, um, opportunities which flow from it, and they produce that fair, orderly, and transparent. Obviously, there's a process of assessment that has to go through, uh, to ensure that what's put in place can meet that, but that's the real potential, I think. Um, now, regulatory barriers uh, and issues, and maybe I'll make a quick comment and then pass to Jorg. Uh, our initial view, and I, we're not the only regulator uh, globally that we believe the financial framework is generally sound enough and flexible enough to accommodate these uses of technologies without wholesale changes to law. Uh, now, it may be that in financial market infrastructure, some of the operating rules or some of the uh, framework around the, the use of this uh, technology may need to be looked at and there may need to be some adjustments to that. But the fundamentals, we believe, are in place. The technologically neutral framework in place. I think that's a, a really important point. The, you know, the ASX, as you know, are replacing their clearing and settlement engine, and there is no regulatory change that's required to, to actually make that happen. The point being that regulation hasn't been an adoption to a very systemically consequential, highly regulated market. They're still forging ahead with that without the need to put in regulatory change. I think that's right. But the, the principles I referred to, which are at an international level and normally adopted at a national level, I mean, they will need to be looked at in a different light in the context of this technology. You know, the risk and controls uh, may vary because of this technology, the encryption, the uh, interoperability issues, connectivity issues which may arise, privacy, security, but nevertheless, the fundamentals, I think, are in place. Jorg, back to six. six big market infrastructure and in, uh, they've announced that they're taking into production, you mentioned. Can you just elaborate a little bit more about what they're actually doing in, Swi in Switzerland, the, what the SIX exchange is considering? Well, I think that the market in infrastructure has to adapt to these technologies and that's exactly what they, they are. They are a kind of a facilitator and they need to be able to adapt and, and to get to grow into this, this new market field. And that's exactly what they try to do. And I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, very, it's a very wise move to do so. Uh, allow me maybe to comment a little bit on, on what just has Please. been said with regard to, to regulation. It also has a, a link to, to six. Um, 
it is important to talk about standards. It's not so much uh, important to talk about a regulatory framework that is focused on, on, on the jurisdictions in which uh, this, this, uh, these developments take place. Because as we all know, fintech is something that can be applied to cross-border. And, and it's nowhere easier to build up regulatory barriers than in the financial markets, or m m barriers to market entry than, than in the financial markets by regulatory uh, exaggerations. And this is something that happens in the past. So I'm very much inclined to see uh, standards set in order to uh, uh, prevent uh, uh, failure and in order to improve the quality. But we are not so in favor of having a regulatory framework that somehow hinders the, the, the technological progress. And that's exactly our approach. That was also our approach with SIX. We sit together with, with our partners in order to see how we can support the business in order to make it safe. And also, and certainly in order to, to enable them to expand their services. And that's exactly the result out of which SIX now is able to, to, to build up this, this platform. And hopefully in order also to become more successful in, in this field. Thank you. Jason. I was just going to say, of, of the three dimensions, business, regulatory, and technology, I feel like regulation is pretty well set. Uh, I feel like regulators all around the world are pretty engaged. And um, my biggest issue is that they all sound interesting. You know, why are companies going to Malta? Malta sounds like an interesting place, and there's obviously some interesting regulation, but then you come to Singapore, and it sounds like the regulatory environment is pretty favorable here, and then I go to, you know, basically you go all around the world, and there's, there's uh, regulators that are engaged and are asking you to come to their, 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 their country and operate there. Uh, and for the most part, they're um, engaged and favorable. I feel like it's much more difficult uh, solving the technology. The technology is still, uh, we're still trying to, to, um, to scale the technology. Uh, the business, the biz business side is still evolving. Um, I think right now we are taking traditional capital markets and just kind of um, deploying them onto the blockchain. But I think in, over time we're going to see new business models that are kind of natively digital that are coming up on, on the blockchain. That's going to get super interesting. Um, but it's the technology that's the, that's the hard part that's da the scale this. David, do you agree? Scalability? What have you been doing in terms of scalability? Yeah, I, I, I want to talk to that because um, there's this, the DTCC just uh, uh, released a very interesting, very expensive long-term study they did on, on this. But one, just one comment, you know, we've been at this for four years. And when I first started talking to the regulators, it was, you know, great concern about everything was associated with Bitcoin. As these gentlemen prove, uh, the regulators around the world understand the advantages from their perspective of this technology. We still shouldn't underestimate the regulator's ability to get in the way of progress at times when it comes to new technology, and in some cases, understandably so, um, because that's their job, which is to, to, to protect folks. But listen, as far as scalability is concerned, um, the, uh, for those that don't know, the DTCC, this is all public now, they announced that at Cybos whenever that was a, a month ago or so, uh, ran a very expensive uh, independent experiment that was managed by Accenture, Accenture, where they responsibly wanted to see if DLT could work for you know their transaction volume, which off the top of my head, I, I believe was 150 million transactions a day. And they were looking for uh, blockchain technologies uh, that could scale to uh, 6,000 transactions a second, which, which on our platform was three updates, so it was 18,000 transactions per second. And they looked across, you know, the Ethereum technologies, some bespoke technologies, uh, IBM's Fabric and the like, and um, R3 and actually your platform, so thanks for teeing it up, Chris, uh, came out at, on the right side of that. So most importantly for the industry, uh, we, we've proven that these technologies can scale to meet the most demanding uh, throughput requirements of the industry. Now that's different than being, you know, my former job was a CEO of Brokertech and EBS Exchange. That's different than, than saying that blockchain distributed technology is the best technology for actual execution of the transaction. But for the pre-trade and post-trade processing, you still need to keep pace and that's been proven. Yeah, that's, I think one of the big points here was that we're hearing is regulation could still get in the way, but there's a lot of people looking favorably and you can implement regulation. The scalability was one of those questions, you know, can you actually scale to this? And the 6,300 that David mentioned was is the average throughput per second that the DTCC requires. I think you have 27,000 is their peak. 
and um, my firm has certainly demonstrated that you can actually get to 29,000. The point that David's making is that there are a number of platforms out there that actually already have solved that scalable problem. Now, not all platforms are created equal, but certainly that should not be a barrier to success. Um, I'm sorry, Chris, I have to disagree with you violently. There's on, two platforms no, just, out there, not many. <laughs> Platform. There's two. Okay, There's, I'm just trying to be generous, but you're right. There are two platforms that have actually that have actually met those the the average uh, d d trade throughput, and um, trying not to do an advert for my own firm, but yes, they, they, it, it, that is an important point. So th there are these barriers that are around. That we said regulatory is there. We said that there are two platforms that have actually solved the scalability problem. What are the other challenges that you think could be in the way of adoption? And let me just throw out one, which would be the business case. Do people actually understand this technology? Are there enough business cases? David, you spend a lot of time doing this. Look, I think the importance of that is that when people stop caring about understanding the technology and just focus on the problem they're solving with confidence that that, that it's, it's being solved and it meets the regulatory requirements, scalability requirements and the like, that'll be, that'll be a good day for all of us. You know, I used to, I'm not a technologist, I used to spend time talking about proof of work and other algorithms and, and the like, and we've kind of moved way beyond that. Everyone knows that this technology works now to understand the advantages of it, and we're, we're seeing real business problems begin to be solved. Now, uh, integrating and migrating are very big problems. So we have to migrate onto the new platform and we have to, in many cases, integrate onto uh, uh, legacy platforms. There's very few use cases that you can kind of shut down your technology on Friday and come in Monday and a whole new paradigm. So uh, it's going to take some time, but I'm really excited about uh, how many uh, use cases are coming to market at the moment. So lots of use cases. Does everybody appreciate which ones are best placed for DLT? Question mark. Um, I'm not sure. Mark, what do you think? Do you think there? What, what do you think is the barriers to the adoption that still are outstanding? Um, just make a few observations just on challenges, which maybe just from the ASX case study. Um, I mean, you've mentioned business case, so I think having a clear idea about the problem and having that discussed and canvassed around the relevant community. So in that case, there's, a, there's an exchange and a clearing and settlement, there's market participants, there's company registries, there's all sorts of different event players involved. That's just some of them, let alone the funds managers who also are the sort of um, buy side in relation to these. All of them need to come on the journey. That is a challenge. Uh, and so ASX has consulted and had public documents. So you can see how they've had to grapple with that, with that community. I wouldn't underestimate that. Other challenges which I think are relevant includes things such as privacy and data. Uh, and so that will be something that needs to be looked at carefully in the deployment of any technology, but including DLT uh, in its you know, transparency and being made available more widely. Uh, so I'd, I'd mention that one. And I think as regulators, we, we have to think about frameworks where there can be potential competition, other players, access to data. So designing the configuration so that it can contemplate those potential future other players, not denying them but a potential business opportunity, doesn't mean it will happen, but being able to just set it up in that way, I think they're just some of the practical issues which go into the design and deployment. Uh, it, interestingly, with, certainly with the ASX, as you know, that whole point about privacy and confidentiality was a key issue. You know, there's, there's a bunch of barriers that we're talking about regulatory, and I think we're all agreeing it could be a problem, but really it seems to be, we, the regulators seem to be embracing this technology. Scalability is an area that we've cracked in terms of being able to scale. Privacy and confidentiality, same point. There are a number of, de, uh, of platforms out there that actually can preserve privacy and confidentiality because they're at the heart of the capital market whilst also providing the transparency that regulators and, 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 and others want. Um, back to the other challenges, there's a couple I've got in my head, things like interoperability. Is that still a challenge or, should, or not? Jason? Um, well, I'll tell you the challenges we're facing. Um, launching a fund. So if you, if you launch a hedge fund, you first thing you do is you select a prime broker. There's no prime brokers in our space. So, uh, where do you start? Uh, everything is piecemeal right now, uh, and everything's being developed, right? The closest thing we have to prime brokers are the custodians, and they offer one thing, they offer custody, but you, you're used to getting a full suite of services. Uh, securities lending is just being created. Leverage is just being created. Um, administration, 
uh, all the back office pieces are just being created. There's 200 different exchanges out there. You have to integrate into every one of them. So the order management systems are being created right now. Uh, smart, order router, smart order routing to all the various different exchanges. Dark pool trading. All of these things are, are, are not in existence today, but are being created so that the markets can institutionalize. Um, it's really interesting to see it all happen because it's, like I said, actually, at Consensus we have 50 different companies that we've incubated. More than 25 of them are fintech related because all of these various uh, industry segments need to be rebuilt um, for this new economy. Um, so I think the challenge we're having and the, what the hurdle we're facing is building all of that infrastructure such that we can you know, institutionally deploy um, um, investments. Hey, Chris, while you're looking, sorry, mate, I, okay, I was no, going to cover for you while you're thank you. <laughs> using a new iPad. I just want to tie this back into the theme, which is uh, barriers to adoption. And I think you did a good job kind of summarizing uh, a bunch of those issues, a number of, uh, w a number of them which are behind us now. When it comes to the privacy and scalability, I, and I'll tie this back to the hype piece, forget the hype, consider carefully what your use case is, and if privacy and scalability is something that is really important, you know, choose the appropriate permissioned ledger. You know, one of the one of the challenges. There's some amazing technologies out there uh, that are that are broadcast broadcast based, like Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, even the core of, of of Fabric, that makes it more challenging to protect the privacy uh, that's required at scale. And so, so my, my point is, is that I would like to tell you that Corda is for every use case in the world, but I have discovered one in a s small corner of the world that it didn't apply to. So I just recommend that all of you just, you know, take your time to really examine. That was supposed to be a joke, Chris. No, thank you. I'm just trying to read all these fabulous questions that have, that have come in. Um, can I just finish off with your, in terms of other, other um, potential yeah. barriers? Yeah, well, Maybe not not so much. We talked about barriers and, and, and risk and challenges. One one must certainly be mentioned with regard to data safeguard and data security and personality issues. But I would like to mention two, which are maybe a little bit out of scope, but which will be of importance to um, to the whole fintech and the whole technological uh, uh, revolution in which we find ourselves. The first is uh, is how to tax the digi digital economy. This is something that governments uh, are thinking about it very creatively. Uh, our position uh, from the outset was that uh, there doesn't need to be any change with regard to the tax system if it comes down to the digital economy. But I can already tell you right now this position is untenable <coughs> in view of the fact that there are, were lots of discussions about the Googles and the Amazons and Facebook of this, of this world who, who were able to somehow organize themselves so that, that they, didn't need to, they didn't need to pay taxes at all. Um, this is certainly a discussion that will happen and that will strongly impact the sector. And the second point that I would like to mention is what from a government point of view is interesting, apart from earning taxes out of the new technology, is the fact, uh, how about labor? Uh, does it create new jobs? This is something that is very decisive, maybe not so much for Switzerland, because we are in a privileged situation not to have a, a huge um, uh, unemployment in our country. But it is certainly an issue when it comes down to replacing, for example, if you start getting into the processes and you, be, you become more efficient, uh, what happens with those persons who, who, were, who, who belong to the old economy? Uh, and what are you doing with them? And, and these are certainly two challenges from the government point of view that need to be addressed. And, and this is something that, that we are thinking about right now. I just want to pick up on some of the questions that have uh, come through from the audience. Um, how do the the audience is thinking, well, hang on a second, how do I get involved in this? Should I get involved now? Should I get involved later? You know, we've heard that there are a number of people taking this very seriously. They're taking stuff into production. If, what advice would you give to the audience about, should they get going now or should they wait? What's the upside of um, going? What's the upside of the downside of moving ahead? So should they get engaged or not? And what advice would you give them? David? Okay, so, so I'd say it's absolutely time. I mean, one of the things that's uh, a little disappointing for me is some of the earliest adopters, especially in the financial world where you're looking for a very fast return, have kind of, you know, not kept up the investment level. Uh, but now it's, it's easy. You don't need great faith. It's, it's the proven technology. Um, you know, if you want to go have a browse, if you go to uh, marketplace.r3.com, 
or just Google R3 Marketplace, of the 150 so apps, we have over 70 of them that are listed there that you can read about and see if they apply to your to your business. And these are applications that have been built on the technology. So, you know, in short, if you're not in the game now, um, you're getting uh, dangerously close uh, to, to missing out on, on some real opportunity. It doesn't mean it'll be catastrophic, but I'd, I'd move now. Clearly the Swiss are starting to move. Um, what advice would you give to your fellow Europeans about getting engaged? Should they sit back or should they get engaged? Well, it depends. If, if uh, getting engaged means to build up uh, regulatory barriers, then I would rather see them uh, sit back and wait and be a fast follower. Uh, if it's about embracing the new technology, I think there is no other, there's no other, no other way around it. So think, think back to the internet, when the internet came. Did anybody think, what shall I do with it? It's just, it's just, it, was a, it was something that just happened and you had to go with the flow. And the sooner you get into it, the, the better for you, because you are able to maybe to steer, maybe to somehow also better mitigate the, 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 the dangers that are implied. Uh, that which the, the new technology implies. So I would say uh, engage, uh, observe the situation closely, try to find out what suits you best in order to be able to anticipate a little bit the risks, but also certainly uh, uh, get into, into the, the opportunities and the chances that are opening up. Mark? Uh, just two quick things. At the business side, I think we would still stand by the first question, which was the business case, what's the problem? And as a, whatever the community is, whatever the issue is, OTC markets, uh, whether it could be a new platform for issuance and clearing and settlement, you know, it's really looking at the community and the niche and the problem uh, and focusing on that. That would be uh, one bit of advice I'd say. And clearly there's a range of technologies that people can look at for looking at that solution. The second thing is at a regulatory level, we need to be engaged and remain engaged and we are. Uh, so there's a number of uh, environments I'd probably just want to make sure that you're aware of um, at the Financial Stability Board and some of these other international um, organizations of regulators, there are communities where we information share on DLT. And a new one's just been established under the International Organization of Securities Commissions. There is a new FinTech network that's been established with about 50 to 60 regulators on them. And there's a work stream looking at DLT. So, and ASIC's on that, but there's a number of entities on that. So I'm just making sure that you're aware that uh, regulators in that community need to stay engaged as well. Yep. Uh, all right, so um, I go in and I, I see a lot of the top asset managers in the world and I have this question of whether they should get in the game or not. And of course they should get in the game, but how do they get in the game is the, the bigger question. When I walk in, they usually say, I like blockchain, I want to lower cost my business, I want to, I want to, I want, I want to find ways to, solutions to lower cost and focus on infrastructure, but I do not invest in tokens, right? That's, the, that's typically what I hear when I go to the large asset management firms and sovereign wealth funds in the world. Um, and that's good, I mean, typically the, there's a three-step uh, uh, evolution. The first is education. We go in, we spend a lot of time with senior management just explaining the blockchain and different ways they can use the blockchain in capital markets. Number two is a solutions approach, you know, actually going in and helping them figure out ways to lower cost in their business, whether it's back office administration or post-trade settlements or other areas of capital markets where they can, they can deploy the blockchain without actually putting any of their investment capital to work, just more just saving costs at the, uh, for their organization. But then the third one, which is my favorite, is actually how can they actually invest in the space? Uh, and of course, you know, these guys are not looking to buy the next ICO or the next, uh, you know, the 20, 20th largest token or anything like that. So I'm not even going there talking about that. But what I am talking about is how the world uh, of, of tokenized assets is coming. And as that comes, there's many different opportunities for traditional asset managers to participate. I mentioned at the beginning, real estate, credit, um, supply chain. These are huge industries that they're already participating in. And, and elements of those industries are going online, or not going online, but going on the blockchain. Uh, and they need to be ready for that. A lot of these, in a lot of these instances, they can continue to participate using fiat, but the actual, for instance, the securitization, the securitization costs are coming down because it's going on the blockchain. They're still using fiat, but the actual securitization vehicle is, 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 is um, the costs are coming down, so they can save money and actually get higher yield by participating in a blockchain-based securitization versus a regular securitization. Those are easy ways for them to get involved without actually converting to crypto and start investing in crypto. But I do think over time, tokenization will come, and I do think even the largest asset managers will start investing in 
uh, tokenized assets, one type or another. Just to, to the point about should you or should you not get involved, you've heard, yes, you should, and you've also heard some of the how. If, um, if Peter Hyam, who's the deputy CEO of the Australian Securities Exchange, were on the panel, because he often gets asked the question, you know, that was a pretty you know, um, scary decision that you made, and a big risk that you're taking putting this into production, he would tell you that the big risk would be putting in place a system now that's probably going to last for at least a decade and not using and not leveraging this technology. So getting engaged, but also be mindful that you choose the right, um, the right technology, because as David said, you know, this technology isn't for everything, but make sure that it is the right technology and ask yourself the question, can I, can I solve this problem without using DLT? And it's um, incumbent upon yourself to do that. And that's a strange thing to hear from somebody who sells this, this stuff for a living. But the reality is we don't want to, David, none of us on the panel want to waste each other's time. So really figure out, is DLT really leveraging the, the problem that you're trying to get to? In the last six minutes, I really want to focus on kind of the future state of things. Who's going to be around in, let's say, two years, five years' time? What are we going to be talking about in two or five years' time? Um, is it going to be about this technology, or is it going to be about, David, what's it going to be about? Two to five years' time, what are we going to be talking about? So, so I get asked the question a lot, you know, if, what's, what does success mean for, for you and R3 in five years? And, and, you know, I feel extremely blessed for where we are now, but really, if uh, winning for us is when Corda is everywhere and no one really knows it. Um, I think Jorg, you made a comment, or one of the panelists made a comment about, you know, about, about the internet. You don't think about how the internet actually works. It just works. We're starting to see this already. So stop focusing on the blockchain. Appreciate the benefits that are achieved through the technology, and we, we can speak to those, but we all have. And really focus on use cases that make sense, the benefits to your business, and how to deploy the technology uh, to achieve your goals. And Jason touched on tokenization of assets. That's going to be a bigger and bigger theme all the time. Responsible tokenization of assets as opposed to what we see in the ICO markets today. And I'm not just talking about fixed income securities, but it's cash, it's commodities, uh, and the like. So that's, uh, we're going to hear a, uh, a lot more about that. But in short, it's about solving problems and not spending too much time focusing on the underlying technology because it works. You? I don't know, <laughs> and I'm not supposed, <laughs> luckily I'm not supposed to know, because um, if I knew as a regulator, then I would like to, I would start to steer the market into a certain direction in which it should develop itself from my point of view, and that would be very dangerous. Um, I would like to see ourselves to be in a position where we have to, where we can say, our regulation is, is principle-based and it is certainly technological neutral. So from that point of view, I do not want to know in what direction it goes, since I would like to have a, a, a regulatory framework that allows the, the technology to develop in whatever direction it needs to, to develop in view of, of customer demands. And there I hope we will be in two to three years' time. We've talked, and David's made the point, it shouldn't be about the technology and it should really be about the business case. What other sort of technologies are we going to be considering, do you think, Mark? Well, I was chatting to some of the panelists before, and ASIC's putting a lot of in interest into artificial intelligence and where it can play a role in relation to conduct, um, supervision and monitoring, really the front line and back line of conduct supervision coming together. So it'll be really interesting to the degree that AI and the data sets for that can maybe connect with DLT-based systems um, because really they are about information and making information uh, readily available uh, in different, you know, different lenses. Uh, so I think that will be an interesting play out in the future. Jason. Okay, so I would say everybody at this conference is here because we're at the intersection of finance and technology. It's a super great place to be right now and it's really exciting and as you can see out there, it's, it's just huge, it's a huge space. So there's three fundamental technologies that we all have to think about. Uh, cybersecurity, blockchain, and AI. Those are the three that are combining to reinvent finance right now. Um, 
Blockchain is a great place to start. I think it's the topic of the day because it is the infrastructure. It is the next evolution of the internet. It's new layers on the internet. You need that foundation to be built. Um, cybersecurity, of course, is important. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of people's identities that have been stolen over the past few years. Uh, it's a uh, very challenging technology, but it's something that needs to be solved for, for, um, for our society. And then number three, um, AI, that's the brains, right? The brains are coming, right? We have, once we build the foundation, AI is going to take us to a whole different world. Uh, that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out over the next few years. Um, I, I would say my prediction, uh, my most interesting prediction over the next few years, and the, comp the company I'm looking for, uh, we talked about this a little backstage, but the company I'm really looking for is a true robo-advisor. And what I would mean by that is not the betterments or wealth fronts of the world, but a speech-based AI bot that I can talk to that can help me with my, all of my uh, personal accounts, whether my credit card accounts, my investment accounts, my insurance, and has the intelligence to proactively tell me where my money should be placed. Once we get to that stage, it's game over. That's a B2C, that B2C AI-driven smart robot is going to be able to dictate how, I, how everybody manages their money. And when that comes, there's so much innovation to happen on top of that. I'm gonna, in a moment, just ask the panelists to give 30 seconds as we, as we come to a close on what they think are the key takeaways from this discussion. Um, but to the question of technology, I think David's absolutely right. We shouldn't be talking about technology in, in time to come. We should be focusing on what the technology can do for you and for your business. I do think that underpinning technologies that are being showcased at, uh, at this event, be they blockchain, machine learning, AI, etc., will all converge over time. And you've got to believe that a shared source of truth, which is what a distributed ledger te technology platform blockchain is, with its immutability, the fact it's a shared source of truth, the data structure, the history is going to be a fabulous uh, font or source of knowledge for many of these AI and machine learning applications uh, going forward. But just in closing, um, in any particular order, what would you like the audience to take away as a key takeaway from, from this panel? Whoever wants to go first. I'm happy to start. I mean, as Mark. we've been saying, the technology is real. It's being deployed. Uh, I, the point I'd probably be wanting to make is, from a regulatory side, engage with the regulator early. Um, so as you're thinking about the problem design, thinking about the configuration that you're wanting to put in place and the options, even if it's about experiments and you're wanting us to be involved or watching, I think talk to us early. Thank you, Mark. Jason? Uh, get in the game. Uh, the infrastructure is, is in the process of being built. It's pretty far along at this point. Uh, you should be in the game now because pretty soon all this stuff's going to come together and you're going to see a whole different world. You're going to want to be there to um, participate in that. Uh, concentrate on solving business problems that matter to you. If you want some ideas, if you, uh, as I mentioned earlier, R3 Marketplace has 70 plus applications. It's going to, something's going to touch, you know, your industry and get you thinking about how you can solve your problems. But there's plenty of information available uh, the technology is not that tricky or challenging anymore. So just, you know, focus on solving your problems and feel free to reach out uh, to us if we can help you. Ulk? Um, try to establish yourself in a country where the regulator plays the role of a partner and uh, uh, try to come to Switzerland because we try to make you successful with your business. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a fabulous discussion. Please join me in, in uh, congratulating our, and thanking our, our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris.